Hello there, you're very welcome to how to back up Linux-based computers for beginners um, on YouTube. My name is Daniel Rosal. I put together these this series of presentations as a YouTube video. It's also going to be going up onto udemy.com shortly as a resource over there as a free course for anybody interested in the world of Linux backups. Um, so what this is, there are a few videos on YouTube about backing up Linux and what I actually wanted to do in this one, um, in this particular video, was to give a presentation. It's going to be a series of slides like you're seeing here and I'm going to discuss, um, basically give an overview for people that are relatively new to the world of Linux or Linux rookies or as Ubuntu's uh, slogan goes, Linux for human beings. So I consider myself uh, Linux human being. I'm by no means a you know Gen 2 user or super advanced even though I've been using Linux for quite a while um, but I do use Linux every day and I have been doing that for more than 10 years. Um, so Linux is really the very core of my computer experience, second nature to me and I developed a, ba I've developed a backup strategy primarily through uh, necessity actually. So one of the most, one of the uh, frustrating things that I found with Linux over the years was that Linux can be quite buggy, especially relative to Windows. And I think that's kind of a well-known thing. Obviously it's an open source um, operating system. There isn't the same kind of development and QAing resources going into Linux, um, even Ubuntu. So Linux has certainly taught me a tremendous amount about computers and as a freelance technology writer, that's knowledge that I use almost every day. So I'm very, very grateful to Linux and to open source, which is partially why um, I'm open sourcing this um, this presentation, why I'm open sourcing my GitHub documentation, why I'm just open sourcing in general, all the stuff that I'm writing. I'm just documenting now my backup routine that I've been using for three years already. And I've been actually doing uh, Linux backups for longer than that. Um, but I think it's really important for people that are interested in Linux um, just to get this knowledge. So Linux has been great for me, as I said, but the the real pain was that as a somewhat unstable operating system, periodically it would just break down. And as I said, not being a super Linux user, there were times where after debugging on you know, Ubuntu forums and Ask Ubuntu and Reddit, I just ran into impossible problems with the package manager. And as I've grown older, so I started Linux, started using Linux when I was 19, I'm now 31, and I've just had less and less time to devote to issues with Linux. I just basically needed to work. Um, and that's that's kind of what I love about it, it, that if it does work, it's a super, super stable system. I'm using a lightweight system here, Ubuntu and LXTE, and when it works, it just works for years at a time if you stick to these LTE upgrades. But that's still, it's still really important to have a backup strategy. So it was about three years ago and I had a succession of reinstalls, which were ultimately due to a hardware issue. Um, but I remember saying to myself, and the interesting thing is the better you get at Linux and keeping your system in good running order, by which I mean a certain best practices, uh, like minimizing your use of third-party PPA repositories, sticking to those LTE upgrades, stuff like that. The better you get and the more proficient at using Linux, ironically, the more annoying it's going to be when your system does break down and you need to install from scratch because in backup terms, your RPO your uh, is going to be getting continuously uh, longer as measured in the time your system is running. And what that, the point I'm trying to make is that you will be con making configuration changes adding programs over time, over time, those will accrue. And when your system finally bites the dust and you have to install from scratch, it's going to be a massive. So I, I've been through this process and um, the last time it happened, I said, I'm either gonna, going to start using Windows or I'm going to um, develop an excellent backup approach for Ubuntu Linux. And I'm not saying that my backup approach is the best backup approach out there, certainly not. It's actually quite a basic backup approach, but that's actually why I'm sharing it because as you said, Linux for human beings. So I did that, that's where my interest in backups comes from. And um, that's why I spent um, a few months recently uh, here and there documenting stuff on GitHub and Medium, just to basically share this info with anybody else who loves Linux, gains from Linux, 
but um, instability and, uh, you know, that's a big issue for them. And, of course, there's just OS agnostic reasons why a backup routine is important. Whether you're on Windows or Mac, you also need backups. Um, so that's kind of the subtitle I have here, how to keep your Linux uh, desktop safe from disk failure, human error, and upgrade disasters. So um, I intentionally included here um, both hardware and software malfunctions. So uh, disk failure is clearly a hardware malfunction, and that's certainly something that can happen to any Linux user. Human error and upgrade disasters is kind of more Linuxy. that if you're using um, Ubuntu and getting those periodic upgrades, that's a vulnerable time for most people's systems. And uh, that's when, if something does go wrong, you'll be very, very happy to have uh, watch this video or another video or documentation and got a good backup strategy running for yourself. So who am I? Uh, this is my headshot here that needs an upgrade. Um, my name is Daniel Rosell. This this to the to the right is my GitHub repository. And if you are interested in Linux and backups, please feel free to follow me at Daniel Rosell JLM. That's all together. Um, I'll be putting it in text here. And as you can see, I have a few repositories um, where I've just attempted to commit into Markdown what I'm doing regarding backups for other people. So as you said, I've been using Linux for more than 10 years. I consider myself a former a reformed Linux serial Linux reinstaller. Um, I've been mostly using um, Ubuntu uh, during this time. Um, I use Ubuntu with LXDE, which is a very lightweight um, desktop environment. I did used to use Lubuntu before they gave up on LXDE and went over to the dark side of LXQT. Um, I've also used Debian, Mint, I've used Fedora a little bit, I played around with Gen2 and Arch, but frankly, I'm too stupid for those operating systems. So I just stick with Ubuntu for the most part. Day to day, um, I'm not a full-time backup person or even a full-time tech person by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, I am a humble technology writer and that's my website. Not This isn't a plug for my writing business. It's just to say that take everything in this uh, presentation with a grain of salt. It's for Linux be Linux beginners. I consider myself a relative Linux beginner and I'm not a full-time, you know, I'm just an average Linux user essentially. So why would you want to, to back up? So we've covered hardware failure, natural disasters, floods, fire, etc. This can happen to anybody, whatever operating system you're using. Um, data protection. Now, what I want to mention here just at the start before we get into the various types of backups and, um, and then we're going to talk about the different Linux uh, programs. Uh, the first thing to say when you're beginning to think about backup and what type of a backup plan you might need to devise to protect your data is looking at um, how you compute. So that's unique to people. So, you know, on Linux and your an average Linux system, you have your user directory files and that's pre-populated with these default folders that, you know, Linux shoves in photos, videos, uh, documents, so on and so forth. And then you have the rest of the uh, system. So you have your system files from the root of the directory um, that contains some uh, packages and just basically the rest of the operating systems in there. So... I personally um, don't really use, don't really do much in the user directory. So I've been in the habit of using the cloud wherever possible for the longest time. As long as I've been using Linux, um, it just has made sense to me to do stuff in Google Docs versus LibreOffice wherever possible. Um, I dream of the day when there are no more operating systems or everybody has some really lightweight front end. I think it's called thin computing. Uh, this idea that's been thrown about and never really took off. But that's kind of always been my aspiration that I really don't do or have much on my um, user directory. And basically, there's a few config files and everything's in the cloud. But So that's what I do. Um, I, I'll, the screencast, I'll be putting it up to YouTube and just deleting the file. And I'll back up from YouTube to my backup system. But I'm not going to be even keeping the this video recording on my computer because... I just get everything up to the cloud as quickly as possible. So um, that's the way I compute. And therefore, for me, protecting the user directory, just doing that, which is what a lot of people recommend, wouldn't make much sense at all because there's really not much there to protect. 
But um, if you are, you know, doing most things locally, if you hate the cloud, you're the complete opposite of me uh, and you've nothing in the cloud and you don't trust the cloud or whatever your reasons might be, um, you are going to then have everything in your user directory and you will certainly want to back that up and you may not change files configurations at all and you may not be interested in backing up anything but the system files. Just worth pointing out that most config files for stuff like LibreOffice and OpenBox are actually nested within the user directory. Um, but there are some things in the Linux system configuration files that are not there. So if you really want to get everything, you you should look at scooping up uh, the system or most of the system, which we'll talk about. So why back up some more reasons? Accidental deletion, human and programmatic via API integrations. In other words, as just as much as... Um, uh, you know a bad not a bad linux upgrade but something that doesn't work with your system can end up really damaging your package manager or some other integral component equally you could um do what i do and uh you know have one click uh, delete enabled and accidentally delete your entire home folder in one click and not be able to recover it so human deletion and human accidental deletion is always a reason there as well Linux specific reasons really the upgrades the brick the operating system um that's that's particularly the case if you're using the bleeding edge non LTS releases in Ubuntu those are less stable driver incompatibility for me has been one that I've you know if I've upgraded to changed out the Nvidia driver gone for a better one a more recent one that has caused problems or I've tried to switch back um so these are all reasons. Um, prevention is better than cure. So if you can avoid uh, getting into a situation in which you need backups, it's better than even having a good backup strategy. So protection against uh, accidental deletion. Uh, this is the same slide over twice. So the Udemy, Udemy video will have to fix that. Um, that. That really covers it anyway in terms of reasons to back up your computer. You have hardware failure, you have natural disasters, you have software issues and you have human error. Those would be the main categories of reasons. So what's inside a Linux file system that you might need to back up? So you can just do an ls uh, command on the root of your file system to see what you've got in there. But the important thing to say is if you are backing up the whole system using something like rsync, you don't actually need to capture every single file, folder, symlink. You don't need to get everything in the system. So as recommended specifically to exclude uh, the following folders. Firstly is device contains device files. Proc uh, is a virtual file system containing kernel and process files. Uh, SysFS is also a virtual file system. That, that's actually just uh, SYS. Temp is, as the name suggests, uh, temporary files. Application start files, mounting the files. Mounting for mounting file systems, that's MNT. And media is where if you do something like stick in a uh, USB drive to your Linux system, uh, it'll be mounted into a mount point in there. Lost and found uh, contains recovered corrupted files. So you don't need, and you actually shouldn't get those things because if you include these in a, uh, in a restore, it has a potential to screw things up. So you will find different lists and different suggestions for what should and shouldn't be included in a full system Linux backup. So, you know, by all means do your own research. Uh, but these are generally the ones that it's a good idea to exclude in a backup. So in terms of what I'm going to be going through in this, um, in this, as I said, open source presentation here, high level overview of Linux backup solutions, um, beginner users. And I'm going to be going through the uh, common Ubuntu backup tools, GUIs and CLIs, going to be looking at uh, cloud backup storage, I'll also be, be just overviewing some um, main backup concepts, backing up local destinations, very important, the 3 2 one backup rule, devising and implementing your personal backup approach. And I'll give you my GitHub, again, Daniel Rosal JLM. I can also be found on Medium, just search for a name, and I'm also on LinkedIn. Now I wanna cover some uh, backup fundamentals to help you protect your system. Um, so what is a backup? A definition coming from Technopedia. Backup refers to the process of making copies of data or data files to use in the event the original data or data files are lost or destroyed. 
Um, second, secondarily, a backup may refer to making copies for historical purposes, such as for longitudinal studies. This is more like archiving, I'd call it, statistics, or for historical records, or to meet the requirements of a data retention policy. So you've actually got two separate use cases. The first one is a classic one we, we, we think of when we think about backup prevention of uh, the loss or the destruction of data. And that's really a misc- risk mitigation strategy if you think about it. The second one is I, I've called it data retention and compliance that you might need to retain your data and archive uh, your data. You know, this probably doesn't apply to individual users, but if you're a company, to adhere to some compliance standards. So um, there are three main backup methodologies. Firstly, you have full backups, and I'm gonna explain what each of these means. You have incremental backups and you have differential backups. So if you need a memory aid to, uh, to, rem- to remember the three types, you can think of, think about backups as a way to ensure data fidelity. And you get it here, full capital FID, full incremental and dif- and differential so let's look at the first backup methodology now i'm providing this information because the main point that i'm trying to, going to try to get through in this video is just to say that yes there are a ton of different backup tools for linux but when you break them down according to whether they are full incremental differential deduplicating um, whether they go to local, remote, if you just use these evaluation criteria, um, it becomes a lot easier to actually understand the differences and you'll actually see then that there's a lot of overlap, you know, and this is just a, a, a feature or perhaps you could argue a bug of open source that, you know, people will come with their own projects that copy the next one. So we end up with quite a big list of backup tools for Linux, but ultimately if you understand these concepts, you'll 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 have a good grasp on what the differences between any two tools would be so a full backup is actually really easy to understand if you have a computer here on the left and it's got three image files one two and three just three different let's say pngs jpegs doesn't matter bitmaps um now you could just simply copy if you, if you want to back up that folder containing those three different images you could just copy and paste that folder from the computer onto a target. It doesn't matter whether we're talking about a, a second internal drive, or it could be an NES, or it could be you know it could be anything. That's not that's not what's important. What you've done is just copied the entire folder. So you've just taken a full backup of the folder the images were stored in. One, two, and three have been synced over to one, two, and three. So that sounds nice, it's simple, but there is a problem to full backups. Let's say we added a fourth image to the folder, let's call that 4.png. Now, clearly the smart thing to do in this instance would be to simply move 4.png from the source, which is our computer over here, to the target, right? There's no point in copying one, two, and three because they're already on the target but that's not how a full backup works. Full backups copy the full file system from source to target each time they run. That's what they do. So in this instance, we would be recopying three image files, one, two, and three dot PNG unnecessarily when we run the backup again. And what we would describe that as is it's got a inefficient or a high uh, data transfer overhead. So, you know, in terms of copying on our local network um that might not seem like such a big deal well we're just going to be copying you know in, intuitively that sounds kind of stupid right we have three files and we're literally just going to be um overriding three files on the target so we're just going to be transferring three chunks of data across an ethernet cable for no reason but it doesn't really make much of a difference if you think about it, right? I mean, it doesn't really cost anything for us to transfer, you know, a few kilobits, a few kilobytes of information. Um, but when we're talking about cloud computing and cloud storage where we might have uh, ingress fees, we're probably being charged for, for uh, read-write operations. In that kind of a case, you can see where full backups uh, begin to make less sense or be more problematic. 
Uh, this is particularly the case, by the way, if we're talking about backing up something big. So, you know, in this case of three little images, you might think, well, it doesn't really matter. We're just going to copy over like, you know, it's going to take a few milliseconds to copy these images again. But uh, this is just a small example. When we're talking about backing up an entire operating system or an entire bank of dozens of operating systems, uh, this this would be talking about, you know, potentially terabytes and uh, petabytes and that kind of scale. So then it, then it really does become quite quite wasteful. So a differential backup, on the other hand, is is kind of the next best thing if you want to think about it like that. Um, it syncs changes between source and target since the last time a full backup was run okay so um differential it runs a full backup um the first time it runs and then every time it runs um you know if you run rsync the first thing rsync does is there's this long hanging process where it's looking at what's on the left here on the source it's looking at what's on the right here the target and it's basically saying okay guys what what's new what's been moved what's been added what's been deleted and I'm not advanced enough to understand the technicalities of the algorithms of the checksums of how this process works on a granular and deep level. But that's basically what's going on. Um, it's looking at what's different. And when you have a differential backup, every time it runs, it's going to copy over the changes. Now, that's actually a good thing because... If you think about it, you only need the full and the differential. If you have to do a restore, you need the full backup and then you need the differential. And if you put one plus two together between the full and the differential, you have enough information, enough data to get back to uh, that point that the differential was taken on, the restore point. Um, so the advantage there is that you have less dependencies than incremental. We're going to see what incremental is next and an incremental means you have a chain so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it in, the, in the next slide but the the two the second advantage of a differential backup is that there's less dependencies so you only need two you don't need a whole chain and the problem with the chain is that if you have one bad incremental one uh, a part of the disk sector that might be corrupted where that incremental is you could run into problems um, the disadvantage is that relative to a uh, incremental backup, each backup is going to be heavier than an incremental. Um, that just is intuitive. Incremental only moves over the changes since the last incremental was run. Hence, you get a chain of incremental backups going back to an initial full backup. The advantage of this is that let's let's think about it in terms of slices. Okay, each slice every time the backup program or the backup script or whatever it is every time that runs the slice is going to be small if you run an incremental backup daily which is what a lot of people do let's just take rsync as a very simple example you're running an rsync from your computer over to a local server or an nes or whatever the case may be you might only be moving a very very small amount of data maybe you created a couple of folders in in, in in my pictures uh you know maybe you installed one program but it could just be a few megabytes because it's not very big um but you do get this this chain disadvantage versus incremental is that all the incrementals between now and your desired restore point at least in theory need to be intact in order for the restore to successfully perform or to perform as as well as it, as it should then there is deduplication and uh, the difference between incremental and deduplication is complicated and again slightly at the edge of my uh, edge of my uh, knowledge so only backs up blocks missing since the original full sync deduplication is also good for uh, creating various versions um, which you can roll back to so in terms of backup approaches uh, two two main types now we, we've gone through the three types of backup and then you have as well just this is kind of one final thing to know um incremental concept can be taken even further so if we have on the source a few file changes and as we've seen in order for the backup to be as lightweight and as efficient as possible from a data transfer standpoint we only want to we're only going to be syncing the changes between the last time that ran well why not take that concept one step further and let's just sync the bits and bytes the data 
that changed within the file. So we're talking here about block level backup algorithms only transfer the data that has changed between runs. This layer is beneath the file system. So you have data um, information and that information is aggregated into files and then you have folders and then in Linux you have symbolic links and all that together amounts to a file system but data is at the core of that if you think about it. It's underlying all that. So when you do block level backup, you're just moving over the data. So you can actually, that takes efficiency to like the next degree. And you can run rsync like this. It's got a delta algorithm and you will just be scooping in the changes in data. And again, I'm not a backup expert. Um, you know, the nuances of how the rsync delta algorithm transfers at the block level are very deep and there are people that are familiar with that kind of level of detail um, and when it will be able to sync delta and when it won't but just suffice to say that's the idea here so that's the difference really between file level backup transferring files and block level backup uh, block level backup is faster more reliable commonly used in disk imaging so we'll talk about clone zilla later and clone zilla um blocks up in uh, sorry backs up in blocks um, and then it just kind of puts those blocks onto constructs an image out of those blocks. Usually it can also do to uh, construct the file system. Um, our sync can run block level syncing if you wanted to. Okay, now we have the three, two, one rule of backups, the essential rule of backups. Backup best practice calls for backups to be replicated twice. Um, now this is where I think the three two one rule is a little bit confusing because what it actually means the three at the start of that rule is the three count comes from your operating system and you have two different copies so two plus one is three right one copy should be offsite and the other offsite now the two which I didn't write out here in the three two one backup rule that means that the two uh, two copies should be on different storage media. So let's just take a look at my screen here. We have next to the Linux, uh, next to Tux over here, we have a uh, clip art picture of a hard drive and we have over here a cloud and we have over here a uh, vault. Now, actually people do store their backups in bank vaults. It still goes on, believe it or not, as their offsite location. So um, we would be replicating this this data we don't want to really have the backup the primary uh the backup source and any copies on the same disk because if the disk fails we lose the backup so firstly we want to have the primary and uh, backup copy one on two different storage media and then to take that concept further um one of those is going to be on site which that means we're going to it's going to be where we are physically located and one of those is going to be off-site. And what we want is for the on-site and the off-site. Now, this always confuses me because technically, if you think about it, they're going to have to be on different storage media just because they're on-site and off-site. But in, in any event, the best practice is to have all these three backups on different storage media. And off-site, uh, one, that's the one in the three to one rule. Um, is that one of those should be off-site. So it doesn't actually mean it has to be the cloud. It just has to be off-site. And again, this is actually where a bit of subjectivity enters here. And, you know, you could argue what, how far from your home is good enough off-site for something like a natural disaster, right? So I would say, realistically, I try to take a common sense approach here. Um in the sense that you know if your home is destroyed in a flood um i think in that instance you're probably going to have bigger problems than data protection if we're just talking about your computer here presumably your cloud data is okay um if it's just your computer you have bigger fish to fry uh, in my opinion but it's nice anyway to have an offsite just in case that does happen uh, goodness forbid and you are able to go over to your friend's house uh, pull out your backup tape or go into your car and restore then you could really take it to the next level and say well what if the what if your whole neighborhood is decimated in a tornado and I just say uh, as we say in um, in the in the Jewish Talmud there's an expression that says which means all the more so so in other words 
what I, what I say to that is if, if you have bigger fish to fry when your house is flooded if your house is flooded and the neighborhood or city has been wiped out in a tornado I think you have much much bigger fish to fry than uh, restoring your computer so um, that that's what I would say there is that be practical be, people have different perceptions about how far of a radius is good enough um you know so you can take more than two copies the three two one rule you it can be the four three two rule or the five four three you can go crazy if you want to um the offsite copy exists to protect against certain disasters right so if your house gets flooded this is really what it's there for it is of course credible but astronomically unlikely that you would have simultaneous disk failure in if you had for example um if you stored, if you had your primary computer and your backup on your NAS, and both the NAS, um, all the disks failed all at once, uh, RAID was useless to you, and your computer failed, and that all happened in the same five second interval, that is possible, very unlikely. What you could have uh, more credibly, and this is a reason why for on site backups, I actually store my on site cold, you could conceivably have a situation in which you had some kind of massive electrical event in your home and both the nas and your computer were uh were sort of fried by an electrical overcurrent uh in which case again you'd be out of out of a backup um so that's why the on-site copy at least at the very least should be on another physical drive from the primary device so that doesn't give you if the comp if you have a desktop computer and it's fried and it's fried the electricity uh, overcurrent comes in, gets through your surge breaker, your NES, whatever you have, and just destroys. So that will not be enough protection. If you have it on a, in a different physical computing device, such as an NES or a, a, a dedicated server, the server might survive, the computer won't. And if none of those, if everything in the house gets uh, damaged by power, then you're down to your offsite. So that's really um, what that is. RPO and RTO are two important concepts in backup. The RTO stands for recovery time objective and RPO stands for recovery point objective. And we're gonna, I'm going to use tech target here for the two definitions. Recovery time objective is maximum tolerable, tolerable, maximum emphasis on the word maximum, maximum tolerable length of time that a computer system network or application can be down. Um, so you set these yourself if it's maximum according to what you deem to be maximum or what your business use case deems to be maximum so in the banking industry for example the rto might be an hour because banking is it could be it could be five minutes in fact so there is a big difference naturally between uh consumer backup and i'm recording this screencast for linux users protecting their own computer here right this this is not I, I don't know remotely enough about backups to be able, you know, to, to venture into suggesting what a bank should use. But um, just to just explain the type of situation in which RTO and RPO would be might be very, very stringent would be those kind of enterprise data protection uh, compliance um mandated recovery recovery times but they do matter here too because it, it provides they're a very easy way to compare backup approaches well what's the rto what's the rpo rpo age of files it must be recovered from backup storage for normal operations i'm going to explain what this actually means in simple terms the rto is basically how long um what's how, how long it takes for you to get your system back now yes that's the maximum time that you allow but in practice it's uh as i'll explain in the next slide let's just actually jump straight to it um you're supposed to really calculate your rpo how much data what's the maximum amount of data i would be okay with losing or i can lose so that's your rpo what's the longest i can be without a computer that's your rpo now go find a backup strategy that meets that rpo and rto that's how you're supposed to do it um, or you can uh, just more credibly, perhaps in the consumer environment, you can see something that roughly fits your these objectives and what you can do, what you can afford to do. Because if you get these RPOs and RTOs down to their down towards a minimum, then you're going to be um, <clears throat> increasing expense, really increasing complexity. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that um, you know you could 
run a incremental backup every five minutes if you wanted to to create a very very slight um rpo uh for your first recovery point um but that would have an overhead on your system it, it would probably slow it down slightly to have rsync running in the background as often as every five minutes so you really have to think what is okay so i'll tell you what i do practically speaking i have rsync um an rsync front end called time shift which i highly highly recommend amazing backup program i have that creating a daily weekly and monthly snapshots for me so my smallest my most frequent snapshot is a daily and that's okay so that means my rpo for that approach is a day the rto is based on how long it actually takes to restore to roll back the system and from my experience that's about five minutes so the rto is very low um if something goes wrong i can get my system back real really 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 quickly and for me the rpo is fine in most cases i don't do anything crazy on my computer in a day i might install a couple of programs on a busy day or i'm changing stuff but i can live with that it's not it's not going to be anything compared to the previous instances i described in which you have ubuntu running for uh two years you upgrade a bunch of stuff you know put on your programs customize things then one day it goes brick you have no backup approach in that case your rpo is going to be two years so one day versus two years take your choice there um so we're focusing on this um this presentation here on protecting a typical desktop or laptop running the linux operating system practical example rpo can be quantified as days data lost when you see comparison tables for backup approaches they're typically quantifying rpo as days data so five minutes would uh, uh hourly would not even be you know, you have to create a fraction of that rto um you can just use days for the two of them so just to give a practical working example if we use borg to back up our desktop we run the job once a night at midnight we know from our test restore that restoring a backup point takes about 10 minutes so the rpo in that case is going to be one day okay and the rto is 10 minutes so it takes 10 minutes to get it back we're running that thing every day so the maximum time focus again on the word maximum we take the backup and one minute later or 30 seconds later something happens to our system and we need to back it up or sorry that's that's incorrect 23 hours and 30 minutes later just before we're about to take the next backup we have some catastrophic system failure what we what we would need to do would be to restore from the last backup so the maximum time that can elapse between the two backups is going to be the rpo there so that gives us an rpo of uh, up to one day and um, in fact that's probably a better way to describe it right and you know rto is probably more like that's what it actually is rpo you can you can use the word up to before that okay now that we have some backup fundamentals under our belt let us take a look at the various uh linux um and this is just a very quick whistle stop tour of uh what's available in backup land as i call it so backup land um in linux you have uh, command line interfaces and you have graphical user interfaces clis and guis i'm just going to go through this a bit quickly because you'll probably the first thing you have done before even thinking about backup on linux is you've googled linux backup tools and more than likely you've come across three or four articles saying something like 20 best linux backup tools 50 best linux backup tools and you've said oh my goodness there are so many different backup tools and that's why i call this backup land because it is confusing but once you break down the what the tools do according to the um, information that i've discussed here it actually becomes a lot less confusing so when it comes to backups basically there are many ways to skin a cat but the ultimate skinning uh, that you're trying to do is to comply with the three two one objective that's just the best practice very very hard to go wrong with that yes it's nice to have encryption if you're backing it up off-site or to the cloud it's probably a good idea to encrypt your backups whether you need to encrypt your local backups that's up to you my opinion i'll give it quickly is that if you're not encrypting your uh, disk um which you can do you can use full disk encryption but if you're not doing that then it doesn't in my mind really make sense to um encrypt your on-site if you're not encrypting your operating system itself because if you were burgled if you're worried about physical access data theft 
somebody could just pop the uh, you know um, the the SSD, the storage out of your computer and rob your data. Um, it wouldn't really the, if if your backup was encrypted, that wouldn't help. So those are the kind of decisions you have to make. Do you need do you need compression? Do you want dedup deduplication? Do you want incremental? Um, but uh, there really are many ways to go about it, and they all do this in slightly different ways. And it's kind of one of the downsource the downsides of open source, the bug of the system per se, that we have such a wild proliferation of different backup tools. So there are a ton of great backup tools, and there's a lot to know about backups. I'm still learning. This is very true, by the way. As I said, this is a beginner tutorial for other beginners. Sorry, I, I want to roll back on that word tutorial. I'm just going to call this a how to because. Uh, it's really kind of peer-to-peer -peer or how I intended this. Um, but you can keep things simple and compare and contrast options if you evaluate according to the simple questions, whether it's incremental, differential, or full, and that's why I've gone through this information. What's running under the hood? Is the backup compressed? Is the backup going to be encrypted? And another question that might be worth asking often is um, whether the backup tool can be run on a uh, live system. So... Clonezilla, for instance, has to be run from a live USB. Most other tools you can just run from aboard the system, which is nice. It's luxurious. You can be using your computer and in the background running a scheduled automated backup through uh, a GUI or through a cron job. Um, and that just takes care of everything automatically. Uh, but Clonezilla, if you want to go ahead and, and image the disks, you actually need to have, you need to basically stop using the computer put in your live USB and go through that process and uh, your computer is tied up, it, uh, it can't be used uh, while that's going on. So um, then you should also ask, is this going to actually contribute to my backup strategy or will it create needless duplication? So you wanna be smart about it and say, you know, realistically, I don't think you'd need more than one on-site and one off-site backup methodology. It's just not necessary. So um, a good, evaluation point is just saying well does it do those two things and uh, do I have my one on site yes is the RPO acceptable yes do I need one snapshot or do I need multiple snapshots um, do I have that off site yes is it encrypted yes or no does it go to cloud storage I have a plan for it yes or no okay and then you're done um, that's it if you're interested in backups you can keep delving through this this whole world but in terms of getting a basic system set up, you only really need those uh, pieces of the puzzle. So RSync is, um, just in terms of the CLIs, and again, a quick overview here, extremely powerful uh, and versatile backup CLI with a ton of parameters there. It, it's running in a lot of different backup front ends, GUIs. Um, you can use RSync for full incremental and differential, and you might be saying, um, Daniel, you've made a mistake. RSync is an incremental tool. That's uh, that's true, but you you can just run RSync one time only and create one backup point. In which case, if you just run RSync once from source to target, you're just going to have one uh, one backup essentially. Um, and you could uh, you could create a few different backup folders on the target and run RSync between each folder. Um, and they will run incrementally if you run them multiple times, but if you just run them on one instance at one point in time, so basically you can use rsync and that's why it is used in a bunch of tools because you can just you can do just about anything with it um, using using the algorithm that it uses, which is a delta uh, syncing algorithm. So it's not G deduplication. There is a difference between rsync and uh, dedupe. Um, but rsync and you know some people will tell you they prefer deduplication and the difference between the two is quite technical so i'm not going to get into that but just suffice to say that rsync is really super versatile um, it can be used in block level but it doesn't support encryption natively um, you can rsync into um, anything with an rsync server so uh, you can have you can have rsync running on a web server in the cloud on a VPS server. Uh, Synology doesn't require, which is the network attached storage, NAS, doesn't require anything extra. Synology, you can just enable rsync and you can rsync over SSH on the local area network and just move stuff across, but uh, that will not be, it, it, won't, it won't be encrypted. 
GRSync is a simple GUI for RSync and uh, RSync is actually what's running under the hood in Timeshift you can all, or you can use BTRFS. Now RSync's um, brilliance is if you take away the, the whole encryption thing it, it, it can be compressed, it's very quick, very efficient if you're using it in the way it's intended to which is running multiple times and just moving over the delta um on the file or block level but the the downfall of it really is that besides ssh um it's not really configured to be interoperable with a bunch of different um hosting systems and that's where our clone another brilliant project uh, comes in so our clone works at the file object level whereas our sync so our clone is just a file transfer protocol it doesn't support um a block level delta uh syncing however um is this is its intended purpose it's a it's between local and remote and the important thing to say here is that our clone does not do remote to remote so you can't use as far as i'm aware and actually i'm pretty certain about that you have to be running it locally on something so you can't um you know use our clone to pull between uh google drive and dropbox you need to come down to some machine where our clone is running first to make the magic uh happen uh okay so it's local to remote or remote to local but not remote to remote um it also does support cloud storage uh backup specific hosting wasabi s3 b2 and that's so that's our sync in our cloud now next we have borg borg uh is has a bit of a cult following a lot of fans of it um i played around with it but never actually really been an active borg user borg is deduplicating uh it does support encryption as well as compression uh again you can use it over ssh you can get borg stuff up to the cloud uh if you use you can use borg and our clone actually in tandem uh and it, you can create nice backup repositories that's a model um and as I said, it can be used in conjunction. And the GUI for Ubuntu is called Vorsa. Other notable Linux backup GUIs would be uh, Duplicity, which is deduplicating, as I've mentioned. Restic is slightly more updated, it's cross platform. And you've Duplicati, which is actually shouldn't be on this list because it is a GUI slash front end. Uh, I use Duplicity to sync to cloud remotes. Okay, so moving on to the GUI's graphical user interfaces. Now, again, this is just a partial selection of what you have on the market per se. And I say market because most of these are not, in inverted commas, because most of these are not paid tools, um, but they are out there. So um, Timeshift is the first one that I want to give a big shout out for. It's brilliant. Timeshift is, um, I'll talk about my own backup strategy before wrapping this video up. Timeshift is a uh, basically... A bit like back in time and uh, it's been so long since I used genome uh, slash gnome and windows really that I can't remember whether back in time is windows or gnome uh, but anyway uh, mac and windows have you know it's a snapshot tool uh, so file shot snapshots are suitable for easy quick and easy system restore and the difference between a snapshot and a backup is that it doesn't actually copy duplicate the files uh, but rather it notes changes to the files so that snapshot versus backup um, I'm a little bit confused whenever I've read that because to me rsync's a backup tool but time shift will actually describe itself in its own documentation as a snapshot tool uh, to me that would mean by extension rsync is for snapshots but in any event uh, it doesn't really matter these that very fine difference to me at least and I think to you if you're an average Linux user, because it can be used for just the same purpose. Um, so as I said, the only thing I've actually had to use in the, if you want the very, very quick and short, short version of this video on one leg in 10 seconds, it's this, uh, get a additional hard drive for your computer or an SSD, but hard drive probably makes more sense for backup storage. If you're running a desktop, uh, I put time shift on that and um there you go you have now a backup system that will probably get you out of 95 percent of problems uh so that's what i actually do and that's basically all i've used to ha to restore my system um so this is incremental as i said it's rsync the first time it creates a full backup job and then it runs um 
creates smaller snapshots and those snapshots are just incrementals so they will basically say um this is what's changed since the last time um i ran myself now important thing to say here and that's that if you think logically here um see the schema on the right where we have a screenshot of my time shift and we have w m w d so that's weekly monthly weekly uh, daily ignore ignore one of those weeklies there um let's just imagine i only have three d w and m so basically those are going to be three folders three snapshot folders in uh time shift and you you know you can navigate into time shifts directory and check these out and you'll see there are three folders there and each folder has what basically looks like your operating system um each one of those is going to be pretty much the weight of up to the weight of your whole system so you can configure rsync to just back up just the user data or the whole folder or you can say do absolutely everything back up my whole computer now if you if your computer is taking up uh your operating system is taking up 80 gigabytes each of those folders is going to be 80 but each time it runs it's just going to basically um uh incrementally change those three folders but they're going to each folder so each snapshot you choose to retain um so just when you're planning this out so if i have a 500 gig hard drive and i'm using 100 gigs um so i basically want to make sure i have at least 300 gigs if i wanted to keep three snapshots and it wouldn't be a bad idea to double the capacity of your of your drive now it's not really your drive it's your drive in use that's what that that is what that is that that's what's relevant here but it wouldn't be a bad idea to even still uh do your drive or do your drive times two um or you could just uh do one snapshot and uh see how much you're using but bear in mind of course that as you're operating system grows in size so too the snapshots will be growing in size so time shift is brilliant um you can run time shift on a separate drive and this is where if you don't have a separate drive so if you're doing this on a uh, laptop with only one drive then this isn't really ideal because um and this is a limitation of time shift in that it doesn't support uh local or ssh or it's really just on the computer itself so as a desktop user this is perfect for me because i can just plunk in another drive uh what you could do instead of time shift if you're on a laptop and you want to you shouldn't really be taking your on-site backup but you shouldn't be taking your on-site backup onto the computer onto the drive itself because that on-site has no protection against uh, disk failure if the disk fails the backup goes with it so what i would recommend doing well actually because there's so many backup tools your options are totally wide open you could use rsync and uh, set up an nas for yourself or you can use a um you could plug in a, you know an external hard drive uh, you know one of those plug-in ssds a passport whatever whatever they call these and uh, you could just run an rsync onto that ideally you want it, you want to do this automatically or you can use something like um uh, you can use clone uh, cloudberry and create a backup plan to an external or to an nes would be more ideal because that can be really run automatically so you know you have options um so you can research those but it can't be run to remotes or even over ssh time shift does and this isn't really much talk talked about but it does have a command line interface so that if you can't get past grub and this has happened to me uh so long as you, you the operating system is um intact and you don't have you know total bedlam in terms of corruption on the disk uh you can actually get into that cli from the recovery menu and you can actually run a uh, full restore uh just using the cli so as i said despite all these other tools cool tools and tricks that has been enough to keep my system uh from requiring reinstallation for the three years since i made this uh commitment to backup next gui i'm going to talk about here is cloudberry so cloudberry is really cool and this is where what i would recommend this is for backing up to cloud storage and incrementally uh is an incremental syncing tool that can be used to sync ubuntu with cloud remotes really so the, these are the ones i'm the, the three backup tools i'm going to strongly recommend that you use and that anybody uses actually are um cloudberry um time shift and clonezilla those are the three that i 
you can use all the other ones and try all the other ones. They might be better for you. But these, for a lot of people, are enough to get you out of problems. So Cl Clyde Berry will do incremental um, to off-site remotes. You can run at file level or block level. Can support encryption and compression. Uh, caveat is that you need to you pay for license. But uh, if you are interested in encryption and backing up to the remote, I strongly suggest you do pay for a license because... Uh, there's just no reason to economize if you're going to be investing in data protection uh, so you can add remotes choose what you want to back up configure a schedule you can do the whole works basically and get yourself a nice um, backup plan running there um, so that's clonezilla so basically it was clonezilla what I, what I would use this for would be if i wanted to uh, back up incrementally i wouldn't really be moving those clonezilla disk images to the cloud um, but if you just want to if you just want to uh, do a smart incremental backup to a cloud storage, this is where Cloudberry is uh, the perfect tool really um, for Linux. Now Clonezilla is disk imaging. Um, so Clonezilla is, a, it's Norton Ghost and other tools like this, Acronis, True Image are disk imaging tools. And this is a separate category of backup altogether. Uh, and what this means is basically you're not backing up files, you're not backing up uh, data block level, you're backing up uh, hardware, you're backing up the actual drive or the partitions on the drive. So you need to run Clonezilla from a live USB. Um, it's totally full backup methodology and it copies over the whole drive or partition. So according to the full, uh, full incremental differential schema, it's on the far end of the full, it just does the whole thing. Target can be local or you can actually do a clone. So you can do it direct to a remote. So if you were in a, um, you know, if you were running a, a clonezilla from a, uh, you know, business premises with business grade internet with, uh, you know, uh, one or 200 uh, megabit per second upload speed or greater, uh, you could credibly directly uh, back up a system straight to the cloud, no problem. Uh, I can't do that because my internet is about one fiftieth of that. So that covers the uh, GUIs um, for Ubuntu. I'm just going to talk uh, briefly um, in this section about cloud backup storage and where you can put your backups in the cloud. So um, in terms of uh, practically speaking, I do put my desktop image in the cloud but it's kind of pointless because um, I've done a test restore and it does put in nicely but uh, I can't conceive of any time where I'd actually want to use it. Uh, in the first instance I would use my, um, I'd be using time shift which is what I use all the time, um, all the time I've needed a backups. If that really really failed and my computer was in such a bad state that the disk had failed or something I would go back to my latest clonezilla image and I can't really think of a time where pulling from the cloud uh, would really make uh, would make a lot of sense, but um, it's it's there, and you might not you might want to just back up to the cloud and back up to Clonezilla. That's something you could do. So you could just do your daily backups to the cloud, skip the local backups uh, paradigm completely, um, and then have a Clonezilla or you know something like that, or a full backup on an NES, just as the kind of harder backup approach. Uh, but if you are storing stuff in the cloud and probably it probably won't be your operating system, it's more likely to be your user files, then um, basically, you know, cloud storage is an obvious place for offsite in general. Uh, that's because uh, unlike a physical offsite, as I said, you can just store a copy of your um, computer in a friend's house. Um, that requires you um, updating a tape, um, going over to your friend's house, um, and repeating that process, you're not going to want to do that all that often, probably. Um, and you need to physically move yourself uh, to somewhere offsite. Uh, and there could be disruptions in your area um, of various types. So uh, basically, although there's nothing wrong with physical offsite as a backup methodology, the cloud is constantly available 24-7 uh, over the internet. And you can do this all automatically. So that's something you can't do if you're keeping a backup copy in you know the boot of your car for instance so uh you could provision your own infrastructure for backups like rent a cheap vps or you could rent from um uh from a cloud storage provider so there's nothing you could use google drive or dropbox to store backups but if you're backing up something like a whole linux system it doesn't really make much sense they're very expensive uh per gigabyte comparatively speaking 
and uh, you'd be much better off uh, just in terms of from a cost perspective and in terms of uh, scalability to uh, use a either object cloud storage or a dedicated backup storage plan of which there are a few so if you're going to be using remote storage uh, important also to check uh, with the whatever you're thinking about using to check if it's supported as a remote so for example if you're looking at duplicati uh, it supports uh, in their documentation you can see dropbox google drive google uh, cloud storage b2 that's backblaze sftp or web dav but it doesn't do p cloud and box.net um and that's it and i am just just crossed the hour mark so i'm going to just finish this quickly with uh, my own backup approach just to show you how a backup approach can work and what you can do to get your own one up and running so as i've said here my backup approach is but one of many possible ways to skin the cat of backing up a linux computer but i will uh, discuss it nonetheless um, just to show, just to put this all together and show you what a backup strategy can look like and one that actually does work. Um, so I have posted documentation regarding uh, my backup plans on YouTube, so please feel free to follow my account there at Daniel Rosal JLM. That's short for uh, Jerusalem, Daniel Rosal JLM, all together in one word. Um, so my goal a few years ago, and this was my old apartment here with its uh, fridge right next to my computer was just to find a totally uh, robust way to back up the Linux computer under this table. Uh, so my goal, as I've talked about, is never to have to reinstall and it's working. I think I've covered all this. I'm just gonna skip through here. So basically here is what I, com what I came up with. And this is, I think, a pretty decent approach for backing up a Linux desktop. For a laptop, um, what I would do is, as I suggested before, I would swap out time shift with something incremental, uh, also using rsync, and I would just change to a NAS or worst case scenario to a uh, plug-in hard drive. So you could just run rsync manually. You could run grsync, and you, that would be kind of manual. You need to hook up your um, hook up your external uh, hard drive and our SSD and run that process. But it would do the trick, uh, but it requires human effort, which is never a good idea. Uh, what would be better is if you could install a second I, d I don't know a lot about laptops so i don't know if you can install a second uh drive if that's even possible on a hardware level but if you could i think i've seen a couple of uh of how to saying that's possible then you could uh do that that would be much better and then you could uh, just use time shift and back up to the second drive so um for time shift um what i do is this incremental on-site daily backup so um as I said before, I threw in a second internal drive and I just do time shifts, uh, restore points. Bear in mind my caveat that each restore point is going to be equivalent to the size of your system in use and can be expected to grow over time or will grow over time as your primary system does. So uh, it's a good idea. What I would recommend is if you had, let's say, uh, I don't know, a 250 gig ssd as your main drive or a 500 gig why not you know why not be generous throw in a two or four terabyte hard drive and um you can throw in as many snapshots uh restore points as you feel essentially you will not be constrained uh, in any way so um that is uh that's something i was that's what i've done essentially so the drive is currently the same size um but uh, I could have gone uh, more intense in that respect. So this is my primary day-to-day -day means of data protection. As I said, I haven't actually acquired anything else, so that's pretty cool. Um, Clonezilla, so here's an NAS and the diagram. But you could also use a, uh, what I used to do before I got this NAS was I used to just use another internal drive or you could use a, um, you could just connect a hard drive in an enclosure. That would be fine too. And this is just a backup to the backup essentially. So just remember that. So I, I do this less regularly. I think once, the, once a month is perfectly sufficient because this would only be needed in the event that the uh, time shift somehow wasn't good enough. Or for, so for example, an, an instance where that would be required if the uh, disk fails, uh, in that case, I would either need to buy, uh, first I need to buy a new disk, I would need to reinstall Ubuntu, reinstall TimeShift, and then hope that the restore, um, my old, and I haven't tried this, but that the restore point from the backup drive would um, you know, work with the new TimeShift, 
um, and that would be, it could just pull in um, it could just pull in the the data. But I wouldn't be overly confident about that. It would probably be easier in the event of disk failure just to just to go back to and that's pretty rare. We're talking about something that might happen once every few years, so it's not the end of the world to have to lose i think a few weeks of desktop data potentially if it's only that irregularly um so i think once once a month as an rpo is quite reasonable here so what i would do is just once a month um i uh, run clonezilla and just back up the uh do a drive to image so i literally back up um the entire drive clonezilla compresses that to an image and that thing goes on to the nas over the LAN, it's a bit slow. Um, if you just use an internal, another internal drive in your computer, so throw in another drive, it will be quicker. But uh, if we're t if we're worried about stuff like um, electrical storage is damaging, so it's a small bit less safe, um, and you don't have RAID. So if you do have an NES, it's kind of makes sense to make use of it just to get that added RAID data protection. But RAID, of course, is not equal to backup. Um, so the second methodology, if you're just doing it internally, that's going to be faster for you because your SATA transfer speeds just running directly through the motherboard are going to be faster than what you're going to get over Ethernet, even if it, even if that's just on the local network. So the advantage of backing up everything, including cloud data. So if, if you do back up your cloud data too, and I highly recommend you do, and I do this, everything for me comes down onto the NAS. So that's kind of a bottleneck in the diagram if you want to think about it that way. And then to get my offsite copy of Clonezilla, I just need to back up the NAS uh, and I'll back up everything in one shot. So that's what I've started doing. I used to keep separate drives for the NAS and for um, my desktop and then I realized it didn't really make sense and it makes more sense even, even though it's a bit slower to Clonezilla onto the NAS versus to do it onto a, um, a, a drive connected to the computer nevertheless um i think it's worth it because it just removes a bit of complication so that's backup one backup one was time shift backup two is clonezilla backup three is the offsite clonezilla and i talked about my synology nas here and that is essentially what i'm doing so i'm just basically using hyper backup which is the one of the tools in synology's dsm to copy the nas if you don't have an nas an, an nas or a synology nas and you're not following this, then um, what you can just do is, in in a nutshell, you you can just create another backup of Clonezilla. So you do, you know you don't need to complicate this. You could um, back up one time onto let's say an external SSD. Okay, that's your on-site. Do that once a week, and then sorry, once a month, and then once every six weeks. Then uh, buy go out to a computer store and buy yourself another external ssd and back up onto uh, that and then you can store that somewhere off site so if you have an office um what you could do is uh run through this procedure every six weeks bring your ssd home from your office uh, write updates update it with another backup bring it to work the next day you're vulnerable you don't have an off-site backup for one day when you're when you're between the time when you're you know leave your office and come back um you can also rotate disks uh, as, a, as another option to get around that problem, have two and keep them in rotation. But that's really a small a small detail. Um, so that would be another easy way to do it is just keep your two disks, uh, sorry, to, to, keep, to have another external SSD, keep that offsite and then just uh, rotate them. And that way um, you will have an, ex you will have an offsite. You don't need an NES for this. You don't even need a, um, uh, you know, you just need two external drives and somewhere offsite. That could also be, it could be your office, it could be a friend's house, you know, somewhere you can access repetitively and reason with, you know, with re reasonable ease, ideally somewhere really not dependent on another person. So if you have, if you rent office space in town, if you work for yourself and you can just uh, go into the office once every six weeks and uh, bring in the disc, that's better than having to rely upon work um but either it should be reasonably okay so this saves me from having to run the clone so that that's the way i do it so that i don't have to um because this hyper backup runs automatically so i don't need to actually run clonezilla two times which you would do if you were uh manually writing two clonezilla backups onto two different uh pieces of storage media um but as i said if, if if you don't have an nas you could do exactly that you could just run it every every month onto your on-site 
um and then every two months onto another drive and bring that back and forth uh to your office or to your uh if you have a you rent a locker in the bank the options are are, are, are manifold many ways to skin a cat you could alternatively push each clone to a backup up to cloud storage using our clone so um yeah that was um it would that probably i don't think you can get it um data block even though if you name the file name the same i don't think that'll work so if you if you give the backup archive the same name and override it in clonezilla i don't think our clone will just put up just push up the delta uh, but if you have a great home internet by all means you could just you know shove it up to the cloud every uh six weeks instead of uh writing it to a physical tape and bringing it somewhere off site uh, that would be preferable of course so if i when i finally get good internet i even if that means a 10 hour upload process i'm going to be uh pushing it up and even i'm sure that'll incur more uh cloud charges that's totally fine with me i will be migrating to that approach as soon as it's practicable for me so the point here is any backup any method would work there's many ways to skin a cat the important thing is that you take backups in the three to one manner one copy on site one copy off site and as i've just said it doesn't really matter in that respect if it is cloud or physical the more important thing is just that it, you get it um off site so uh backup four here for cloudberry off site so this is if you really want to go um you know round it out here and this does this allows you to do a cloud a cloud uh incremental desktop backup to cloud storage irrespective of whether you've got great internet or terrible internet because it's incremental so it's only syncing up the changes so a good tool for this and this is why i showed it is cloudberry um if you're doing this bear in mind that you are going to be creating three copies of the same data right we're going to have our uh time shift running on our local computer that's one we're going to have our clone our uh we're going to have our uh clonezilla running onto sorry this should be this should be this should be four actually four copies we're going to have our clonezilla onto our local nes or external drive that's two we're going to have our clonezilla onto our offsite drive that's three copies of the data and this would be copying the data for a fourth time if we were to also incrementally so i think that's a bit excessive um and i i say it's not needed because to be honest as i've explained before i can't think of a if ever of a really sensible instance where i'd need this time shift has an rto of minutes that's quicker than the cloud uh and cloudberry uh sorry that that should read clonezilla clonezilla works disk to disk um so i wouldn't need to, if if the time shift didn't work and i really needed to get a bare metal recovery in place uh i would do that through cloudberry because you know to get sorry through clonezilla because to get clown cloudberry restore operating if the disk failed i'd have to not only reinstall the disk I have to reinstall the operating system uh, that's the operating system layer i'm gonna have to install the application layer which is cloudberry so a lot of work but if you do want to cover all bases by all means do that so i hope this intro to linux backups has been useful uh in summary the three two one approach is really the key thing um the differences between the various different backup tools and duplication versus incremental matter less really in my opinion than getting the fundamentals in order that are you keeping one copy off site and one key, one copy on site there are many ways to skin a can as well as a cat apparently that should say cat choose whatever works best for you um encrypted versus non-encrypted incremental dif versus differential if you do have any questions uh please feel free to reach out to me on github that's daniel rosal jlm linkedin medium uh i've also got a contact email listed here on youtube so Thank you for watching this video and uh, to your backup success.